back to polars more specifically. So now we know it's rust uh, background. We know that even the RS suffix on it is related to the rust file names. And so that's clever. Uh, we know that you develop in rust in order to be developing the polars library. For somebody who is a data scientist who isn't necessarily a software developer like you are, but for somebody who wants to be taking advantage of polars, why should somebody install polars uh, into their Python instance instead of pandas? I, I hate to give the boring answer of it depends, but that's often the answer <laughs> to lots of technology questions. Yes. So my general advice is if it's not broken, don't fix it. If you've got an existing uh, pandas project that works absolutely fine for you, then I think there's probably better things for you to focus on than rewriting it in Polars. But if you're starting a new data science project, then that's when I typically recommend people, okay, this is a good time to give Polars a go. I think if you start a new project and you try to think in Polars right from the start, you'll end up writing idiomatic code and you'll have a lot, a lot of fun. Something a lot of Polars users say is that it's surprisingly pleasant to write Polars code. And it's nice to see what the library does for you. The, the syntax is very nice. I think that's one of the major APIs, major innovations that the library has brought, aside from just a phenomenally good implementation. Gotcha. So I, I would have maybe assumed that the API, that the, the syntax would be similar to Pandas. But actually, what you're saying is it's, it's quite different. That's right, yeah. So the idea of trying to re-implement the Pandas API, but with a different, faster backend and all of that. It's been tried with varying degrees of success. With Polars, I think this is a really nice success story. Richie just had the courage to try something different, to say, well, you know, Pol uh, Pandas, it's uh, successful, it's popular, it does what it does. Let's try doing something different. Let's try not having row labels. Like, let's just not have an index. I think any of your listeners who are familiar with pandas, most of them are probably used to having to do reset index uh, every two or three lines of pandas code in mm -hmm. order to get things to work. Mm -hmm. There are pandas users who use the index very intentionally and they can make great use of it. You can get performance improvements from using the index very intentionally. But I think the majority of pandas users, for them it's probably more of an annoyance than anything else. and. Uh, so I think Polos has really made a good design decision here. Like most users don't need to worry about their rows having labels. The a side effect of, of this is that it makes uh, certain performance optimizations easier. And the, the company is now working on distributing Polos. And the company, Quantsite. Sorry, uh, the Polos company. The Polos company. Yeah, exactly. So when it comes to distributing Polos, then it should be easier to do that if you don't have to worry about having an index. Whereas companies that have tried distributing pandas, like Dask, they, they do have an index, but it, uh, it does cause some difficulties. I see, I see. So there is a Polars company that is commercializing the Polars open source library that anybody can access and install. Yeah, that's right. So there's a, yeah, there's a company that's behind the open source software. Most of the core developers are hired by the company. And so the, the open source software Polars is and always will be open source, according to Richie. However, they also, they're also going to make some, um, some, some, yeah, some other offerings, like a cloud offering distributed. And these are things that are going to be paid services. And that's what the company is working on. Makes perfect sense. Another aspect of Polars that I understand, so you've mostly so far been talking about Polars being a great choice for people who want to be manipulating data frames and kind of have more fun, have an easier time with the syntax relative to what they might in Pandas. Um, but you've previously, on another interview, you described Polars expressions as functions that only take effect once you put them inside the data frame context. Can you provide an example of how this lazy evaluation benefits data processing um, and any kind of maybe concerns people should be concerned about as users when they, when they, when they do evaluate in this way? Ah, that's fantastic, yeah. Expressions, really one of Polar's innovations. Like I don't think it's something that Polar's invented. Like PySpark had something similar in, uh, 
some R libraries, I think they had something similar. But the, the way they work in polars, I think of, a, of an expression as a function from a data frame to a sequence of series. Most users don't think of it in these terms. Most users just think of it as uh, grabbing a column from a data frame and then doing some operation on it. People usually get an intuition for what expressions do fairly quickly. In terms of what advantages, apart from just how nice the syntax is to manipulate, the fact that an expression is just a function, so it doesn't, it doesn't need to be evaluated right away, means that when you've got a data frame context, polars can analyze the different expressions which you've passed in, and they can apply certain, certain optimizations. For example, the classic example that Richie gives is if you're taking a column and uh, doing a sort and then selecting the first five elements, then uh, this has right. got uh, right. n log n complexity, but right. you could just do a top k algorithm and then uh, the complexity there should be linear. I think something like that. Another example is you might have, you might be doing feature engineering. You might be making two features which both start with something very similar, like, I don't know, take the absolute value of the logarithm of something, and then one feature you're doing like uh, shift one, in the other feature you're doing shift two. You know, people are often making features where part of the calculation is very similar. So then Polars can do common sub, sub, common sub plan elimination. It can see that some parts of the expressions are very similar. It can just assign that to a temporary variable, just calculate that once and then reuse that between the different uh, features. Another advantage of using expressions in uh, data frames is that it lends itself very nicely to parallelization. So if you're just making a single operation on a single column, then it's often just not worth, worth it to set up the overhead of doing uh, multi-threading. But if you're calculating, let's say, uh, five different features which are independent of each other, then it it's quite natural to say, okay, we'll do these five uh, in parallel. And uh, yeah, like this, people can often get like uh, 10, 20, 100x uh, improvements by writing things in polars compared to what they might have got with uh, some other frameworks. Wow, and that, does that include the parallel, like that 10, 50, 100x, that includes the parallelization or? Including everything, so including yeah, yeah. parallelization, including uh, query optimization that we get from doing things lazily, uh, just the whole package. It's, it's going to give you qu quite a significant advantage, both in terms of runtime and in terms of terms of memory. Nice. And let me try to break down that lazy term a bit for listeners who might not know it, and kind of maybe in the context of what you just said. So, if I were working in an if if the code that I was working with was working in an unlazy way. Uh, which could be a pandas data frame. And if I have a pandas data frame with only a hundred rows or a thousand rows, and you know, I want to do a sort like you described before I take like you know the top five after a sort with only a hundred rows or a thousand rows in my data frame, I'm not going to notice in in real time, I'm not going to notice any problems with that kind of um, with that kind of evaluation. But if I have a million rows or a billion rows, then that pandas data frame, I'm gonna be just sitting there for who knows how long, <laughs> uh, you know, while that sort is, is, while I'm waiting for that sort to actively execute, but with this kind of lazy valuation that is supported by polars behind the scenes, so it doesn't actually execute the code until I ask for some kind of output. And when I ask for that output, there's lots of performance optimizations behind the scenes, like you described in much better detail than I could. But the kind of the net effect is that it means that um, if I need that kind of that sort on a huge data frame to happen, because it's not just um, because it's not actively executed in kind of um, a more simple-minded way, it's lazily executed in a more clever way. Uh, and so lazy meaning that it doesn't execute until it has to. Um, because of that lazy, doesn't execute until it has to, performance optimized behind the scene execution, you get these huge speed ups like you described with the sort scenario, um, you know, to use some computer science terminology, it was a linear 
uh, increase in, in compute as your data frame gets larger, as opposed to n log n, which is much more, much more, much more computationally expensive when things get larger. Did I do an all right job of kind of, kind of trying to recap what you said there? Yeah, totally. I think you got the spirit of it perfectly. Nice. All right. Um, so another, uh, another aspect of pullers that allows it to differ from other libraries is uh, that it optimizes string operations and data processing in particular. Uh, do you want to talk about that? Sure. Right, we need to make a little pandas and numpy comparison here. So we need to go back in history a bit. Pandas originally built on top of numpy. Numpy did not, has not traditionally had a string data type. They do since numpy version two, but traditionally if you wanted to store, to, to, to store strings and maybe they're of different lengths and all of that, you're going to have to just use an object data type in NumPy. So in object data type, every element is just a pointer to a string. And that comes with all kinds of uh, performance and memory uh, footguns. With, uh, right, so that's, uh, that's the historical part. Then in Pandas, this has traditionally been a bit of a weak point. So I think since Pandas 1.5, it's been possible to leverage PyArrow to use a specialized string storage. So how that works is there's like a really long string behind the scenes. And for each string in your series, uh, Pandas is recording like where the, where, where the string for that particular row starts and where it ends. And like this, it's... Uh, it ends up with better performance and memory uh, characteristics compared to just using the classic object data type NumPy ones. Poilers have taken it even further and they've, they've got a whole different kind of uh, string. They've written a whole blog post about this and that enables uh, further optimizations, especially if you've got repeated strings. So that's, that's the deal. <laughs> um, Perlas uh, makes your makes working with strings really nice. It also just does this natively. You don't need Pyaro installed in order to make use of Perlas strings. And I guess one, this is of increasing and increasing importance with how natural language processing is becoming more and more and more of data science. Totally. So there was a time when Travis Oliphant, who we talked about at the outset of the episode, when he would have created NumPy and SciPy almost everyone who was using Python, I don't have the stats on this, but just based on my experience and seeing what was happening out there, most of the time you're working with tabular data. And those tabular data, by and large, they were numeric. I mean, for sure with NumPy. Um, and Pandas was designed to go a bit beyond that and be able to handle lots of different data types um, you know, in, in kind of one matrix structure where you, know, you have one column that's strings, one column that, that's numbers, and so on. Um, so more like working with the kind of data that are in a spreadsheet that you might have in Excel. Um, but we are now in this era of data science where natural language processing capabilities are so profound, um, thanks to things like large language models, transformers, generative AI, we have so much more interest in natural language um, processing than ever before. And so it seems to me like having these, this kind of, these string optimizations uh, will come in handy. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, even if you're not working in NLP, if you're working in, in traditional data science, you're probably working with some columns which are strings. Like maybe you've got a column which tells you the name of your vendor or the name of your supplier right. and all of that. You can see the difference that this makes with the TPCH queries. So this is a set of popular da database benchmarks. It's, uh, typically writ it's originally written for SQL engines, but it's been adapted to data frames. And you can see the difference of running those in Pandas, just uh, classic data types. And then in Pandas, where the only difference you make is to use Pyaro strings instead of the classic object data type. And typically, most queries get about twice as fast, even though in those queries, you're not doing anything string specific, like mm. just doing a join that includes string columns even if you're just uh, comparing two columns for equality. Mm -hmm. any, any, any operation where strings are there in the middle, it uh, benefits from this. 